So I'm going to tell you about um, work we've been doing looking or elucidating gene regulatory networks mediating defence in Arabidopsis. And the pathogen that I've been concentrating on, we'll tell you mostly about, is Botrytis cinerea. Uh, so it's a, a necrotrophic fungal pathogen uh, which causes large um, economic losses. It's got no uh, apparent host selective toxins and has a very broad host range. Um, but despite this, uh, it's not a sort of blunt killer. We've spent um, quite a lot of time showing that there's uh, variation in uh, virulence of different pathogen isolates and variation in susceptibility of, of different hosts, and that the fungus is also capable of manipulating the host for its own advantage. So I just want to show you a couple of slides from that work um, to show you why we're, so, why, why we're particularly interested in, in regulatory mechanisms. So one of the uh, major responses of Rhabdopsis to botrytis infection is accumulation of camelexin, which is a, a phytoalexin, so a small antimicrobial compound. And what this slide shows you is just that we get uh, different levels of camelexin accumulation when we infect different ecotypes of Arabidopsis. And what we showed was that uh, accumulation of camelexin is inversely correlated with um, lesion size. So hence, camelexin is one of the sort of key determinants of how susceptible uh, a plant Arabidopsis ecotype is to tubotritis. But what we then did was induce camelexin accumulation um, without the pathogen being there. So we can treat ecotypes with this herbicide acyfluorophen, which induces reactive oxygen species, um, leading to camelexin accumulation. And the crucial thing shown here is that the accumulation of camelexin after the herbicide treatment is not correlated with accumulation of camelexin after botrytis infection in the ecotypes. So those ecotypes, they're not got a sort of maximum uh, camelexin accumulation per se or a maximum biosynthetic capacity. It's actually regulatory uh, differences between them that is leading to a difference in camelexin accumulation. So you can induce camelexin in a different method and get different levels of camelexin in the ecotypes. So really this shows us that we've got differences between Arabidopsis ecotypes in terms of how uh, either sensing or responding to botrytis. So we set out to, to elucidate what these regulatory networks were. And rather than sort of traditional network building where you're doing experiments on, on specific components, and we had there were a number of uh, genes that had been identified which influenced susceptibility to botrytis cinerea, and for a few of those we had some direct targets. But they tended to be sort of isolated. There was no linking between those genes. Um, so what we set out to do was to sort of try and um, build some overarching networks and using a systems approach. So we used this reverse engineering or network inference approach where we, we try to infer regulatory networks from gene expression data. So this was um, carried out uh, within the, all the work I'm going to talk to you about was carried out within the PRESTA project, so Plant Responses to Environmental Stress in Arabidopsis, which is one of the SABER grants um, funded by BBSRC and EPSRC. And there's a large number of people involved, so I thought I'd just put up the acknowledgements at the beginning. So there's both um, experimental and theoretical PIs, both at Warwick and Exeter and Essex, um, a large group of postdocs, technicians, and also a fantastic group of PhD students. Um, and really, a lot of the, the work has been driven by these PhD students who um, do both computational and experimental work. OK, so the basis of, of Presta um, Presta project is looking at, at multiple environmental stresses. So we know that environmental stress is a sort of key sort of yield limiting um, problem in, in crop plants. And we, we also know that abiotic and biotic stress is increasing evidence that they share common components or maybe some core networks um, shared between abiotic and biotic stress, but then overlaid with more, more stress specific pathways. The other thing to point out about Presta is um, it was very focused on transcriptional changes. We know there's more layers of regulation, um, but you, know, you can't do everything at once, and, and transcriptional change is very tractable. We can measure gene expression changes very easily. So we've focused on, on changes in, in gene expression, gene transcription. So as I say, we've, used, um, we've looked at various different stresses, um, sort of developmental time series going through to, from mature leaves to senescence, um, different pathogens and abiotic stresses. But most of the work that I'll talk about today is from the, this fungal pathogen, 
um, but we're also linked to, to some of the senescence work. Okay, so the, so the overall sort of workflow for the Presta project, as I say, we're, we're using a, a network inference or reverse engineering approach where we try to infer um, regulatory networks from gene expression data. And the crucial part is that you have to have a time series. So we start off, we generated time series data for these five um, different, different stress conditions. After that, we, we identify target genes for network modeling, we can incorporate some prior uh, knowledge about, about these genes, and, and generate small-scale networks. So the other so the crucial point is that we're not generating one big network. Um, the data that we have means that, that we can model a, a relatively small number of genes together at a time. So we're generating lots of small networks. We then go through a, a phase of sort of iterative phase of validation or extension of the models, revision of these models. And what we want to end up with is a small number of validated network models, which we will go on to parameterize, um, but also to use these for sort of translational work. How do these um, transfer into, into crop plants and evaluate how, how useful these, these networks are um, in trying to link this work into, into crops. OK, so the time series that I carried out for Botrytis infection. Um, it was a high resolution time series, so it's not a biologist time series, it's what mathematicians think is the absolute minimum. So we had 24 time points. Um, so we infected detached leaves, so these droplets contain um, suspensions of, of spores of Botrytis cinerea, and we harvested an individual leaf every two hours for 48 hours. And you can see it's around sort of 24, 22 to 26 hours, you can start to see first sort of primary lesions within the droplets. But you don't see spreading lesions till around 36 hours. So we've got 24 time points over 48 hours. We also took, uh, did a highly replicated experiment. So we've got four biological replicates, so four individual leaves um, at each time point, And then we did three technical replicates. Um, and this was using um, CATMA microarrays. The other point is that uh, every sample was the same leaf off a different plant. So we took leaf seven um, from, from a separate plant to try and minimise variation between, between different samples. So this is sort of shows you yeah, the overview of what I'm going to talk about today. So the, the crucial thing, as I say, it's not one network model. We can't take all 30,000 genes and, and come up with some amazing network model. The data that we have, even though it is a large data set, means that we can model about 80 to 100 genes at a time. So a crucial part of our work has been developing methods to select genes to, to model together. We then generate these network models and, say, go through this iterative basis. So the first way to sort of try and identify our target genes was, first of all, let's, let's identify genes which are differentially expressed. Um, in response to infection. And here we also had to sort of develop a new tool. So our data sort of fell between the two sort of um, uh, two usual types of data. So traditional sort of methods like F-test assumes that the data is cross-sectional in that there's no relationship between data at this point and data at the next time point. And obviously that's not true. We've got an infection process which is, which is going on through time and there should be some relationship. But equally, a sort of time course package by... Um, Terry Speed assumed that replicates at the different time points, so that the first replicate here had a relationship to the first replicate at time point two. And again, that wasn't true for our data set because we just had um, every sample was from a separate plant. So there was no relationship between the, the first leaf we harvested on day one at uh, two hours and the first leaf we harvested at, at four hours. So together with um, Zubin Garamani's group at, here at Cambridge, we developed this Gaussian process two sample test. And what that does is basically fits either two Gaussian processes to the data. So the green samples are the mock inoculated data. So it fits a pro process to the green samples. And it fits a process to the infected leaves, the red data. Or it fits one process to the whole data set, which is the blue line here. And then evaluates which, which fits the data better. Is it the two, two processes or one? And in this case, it's the two processes, so we say that this gene is differentially expressed. And from this tool, we could also get a time of differential expression. So at the top here, when the top box becomes smaller than the bottom box, um, we say that, that gene is differentially expressed. So by applying this 
um, tool, we have nearly 10,000 um, Arabidopsis genes which are differentially expressed in response to infection at different times. They're not all expressed at the beginning. Um, some of them are expressed um, only, differentially expressed only very late on. But we can identify, yeah, obviously, nearly a third of, of the genome. If we um, cluster these 10,000 genes using spline cluster, a method by Nick Hurd, um, you can see we get different expression profiles over time, um, up, down regulated and up regulated. And by, by being able to cluster over time, we're hoping that uh, the genes within this cluster are, are more likely to be co regulated um, than just co expressed. And we can use these clusters to try and um, uh, tell us more information about the timing of different uh, processes during defence. So if we look at these clusters in a different way, so here we've got a heat map where red is high expression and green is low, um, and we're going from two hours to 48 hours. You can see that there's a major shift in gene expression around 26, 24 to 26 hours. And this correlates with... Um, the, the lag phase in pathogen infection. So this graph up here shows um, botrytis gene expression, a tubulin gene, um, as an indicator of, of fungal growth. So you can see, as we know, um, there's an initial uh, growth phase, then you get a lag phase. Um, so during this, you get primary lesion um, development, so penetration of the leaf and the primary lesion. Then you have a lag phase, and then you have a growth of the expanding lesion. So a major change in gene expression seems to occur in the middle of the lag phase, which is around this time point, as again, you can clearly see before you've got any expanding lesions. So, so very little of the leaf is actually sort of um, been infected by the, by the pathogen. And, and all this gene expression is from a whole leaf. So first of all, um, <laughs> well, one thing to say, even, I mean, even though we've got a high resolution data set, if we could do this again, we would obviously want to go back and, and increase the number of data points um, around this time, um, because this obviously when a lot of things are happening, um, and with hindsight, it would be good to have sort of you know, 15 minute, 30 minute time points over this period. But we can do a lot with the data set as it is. And, and despite this sort of major shift here, we see a lot of genes which respond earlier or later or transiently. So here we've got green, red, green. <clears throat> so what we've... Um, done with these clusters is we use another tool developed by Chris Penfold um, at Warwick, which basically uh, finds the time at which a gene expression profile has a significantly positive or negative gradient. And what I'm showing here is for each cluster, the time at which at least half of the genes in that cluster um, have a significantly negative in blue or positive in yellow gradient. So you can then order these clusters in terms of when the gene expression in each cluster starts to change. And what we've then done is looked, used Bingo tool to look um, for processes going on in these clusters um, to then be able to order the processes um, over time. So I haven't got time to go into this in a great detail, um, but this shows you some of the, the Go terms. So these are are go terms that are overrepresented in a specific cluster. So there's more genes with this um, involved in this particular process in that cluster than you would expect by chance. And you can see um, some sort of logical <coughs> subsequent steps. So for example, at uh, can't see it. 14 hours um, after infection, we've got ethylene synthesis. And then two hours later, we have response to ethylene overrepresented. And many, you can see many hormones are involved. Um, and particularly, we've got ABA. Uh, involvement seems to be much later than, say, ethylene and, and jasmonic acid. So we can start to actually tease apart the defence process and order um, the, the involvement of, of different uh, pathways. The other thing that's come, that came out from the, from the um, GO analysis is more evidence of this sort of crosstalk or shared components between biotic and abiotic stress. So many clusters were overrepresented for GO terms um, response to abiotic stress. And you can see a, a wide variety of abiotic stresses um, at a number of different time points um, over this, this period of infection. OK, so we have, we have biological processes that are enriched in particular clusters. But what we really want to know is well, what's regulating these genes um, that are involved in the same processes. 
um, and are these clusters uh, representing genes that are co-regulated. So Richard Hickman has um, developed an algorithm to look for overrepresentation of known transcription factor binding sites in the promoters of genes in a particular cluster. And what we find is that um, you do see clusters which are overrepresented for specific sites. So even though some of these um, motifs are quite, are quite short, you can still find clusters where the 500 base pairs upstream of each gene, um, there is, is more of these motifs are, are present than you would expect by chance. So here we have um, sort of selected clusters. These top half tend to be down-regulated, whereas these bottom half are, are up-regulated. So, so we have... Um, so basically, what, what a time series expression profiling has enabled us to do so far is we can identify um, many more genes which are differentially expressed in response to infection than, than previously, um, and also genes which are expressed at different times, um, and also genes which are expressed transiently. So many of those may have, would have been missed in sort of the one or two time point um, experiments done previously. We can cluster these genes according to their expression profile over time, and they're like, more likely to be co-regulated. And this statement is backed up by the fact we can um, identify specific clusters enriched for particular biological process, genes involved in a particular biological process, and also enriched for, for genes regulated or containing a known transcription factor binding site. And we can also start to determine the, the chronology of the defense process. Um, and in addition to the GoTerm analysis, we could, we're looking at um, the genes and, and looking for particular pathways of when they're, they're um, being in, activated. So, for example, defensins, when, do they, when are they induced, and so on. But what we also are doing, which is the really sort of uh, power of a time series, is, is using a time series to predict transcriptional networks regulating these, these responses. So the modelling um, that we're using was developed by um, David Wilde's group called a Variational Bayes State Space Modelling, or VBSSM. And um, this is a linear network inference algorithm. And, and the in, the, it will um, predict gene-to-gene -gene, um, interactions. And these are not necessarily direct. So they could be indirect, but it's predicting that one gene has an influence on the expression of another. The, sort of the, different, the key point about VBSSM compared to many other Bayesian dynamic network approaches is that we can include a number of hidden states. So this um, accounts for things that we can't measure or haven't measured in our experiment. So we know that transcriptional expression is not, um, or changes in, in transcript abundance is not the only method of regulation. So via these hidden states, we can account for changes, post-transcriptional regulatory mechanisms, or genes that weren't on the array, so haven't been, been measured in our system. So the, the modeling um, can include this number of hidden states, and there's a, there's a process for sort of determining a sort of um, optimal number of, of these hidden states. Because it's a Bayesian dynamic network, we can include known interactions as priors, and we can weight those depending on the evidence for that, for that interaction. And there's also a mechanism to enforce sparsity in, in the <coughs> networks. So biological networks um, are thought to be relatively sparse, and so this is, this is included in the, in the algorithm. So to show you it in a sort of uh, diagrammatic way, so U is the sort of initial state um, of the network. And Y is the um, gene expression profile of all the genes that we've measured over time. So time point one, time point two, and so on. X is the state of the, of the hidden states at time point one, two, and so on. So what the VBSSM is doing is saying the expression of genes at time point one can influence the expression of genes at time point two either directly or indirectly via these hidden states and also that the hidden states can influence each other directly. So it takes all those sort of interactions into account um, to come up with a, with a predictive model from the set of genes that you give it. Okay, so as I said earlier, we can only model sort of 80 to 100 genes together. So a, a crucial part is how do we, we get those genes? So obviously the first step was to um, find genes which are differentially expressed, but that still leaves us with 10,000. So we've used a number of tools to try and um, select genes to, to model together. So I'll tell you about three today, TCAP, Apples, and the, the probabilistic network search. 
to first of all this, this TCAP um, gene module selection. This was developed by a, a PhD student of mine, Stephen Kiddle. And it's very simple, but it's, it's just a, a different algor uh, clustering algorithm. So rather than the sort of um, what it does differently to normal clustering is it does cluster genes based on their expression profile, but it also clusters genes which show inverse expression profiles. So if a gene, some genes are peaking up, it will also include genes which peak down at the same time point. Because the rationale behind this was we, we, we thought, well, if we're looking for genes which could be regulated together, a transcription factor might repress some genes and activate others. Then it also includes genes whose expression profiles are correlated, but with a positive or negative time delay. And again, the biological rationale for this is that if we've got a high resolution time series, then we expect to see expression of the regulator um, prior to expression of its targets. So the expression profiles could be correlated, but you expect, expect the transcription factor regulating them to be, to be um, changing earlier. So you end up with clusters that look messy like this, but when you shift them around for time and inverse, you can see that the, the profiles are nicely correlated. So this is one such cluster. Um, and in this cluster here, uh, there was a single transcription factor, colored in red, which had a, a negative time delay. Um, and then there were some targets which you could imagine it could activate and targets that it could repress. Uh, this cluster was particularly uh, uh, strong to follow up on uh, because of this transcription factor with the delay, but also because it was, the cluster was overrepresented for the term response to abscisic acid and had a, a conserved motifs in the promoters of these genes. So you can see that this, this gives you clearly test, clear hypotheses to, to go and test. We've phenotyped a knockout of Atmibal 2, and it shows a mild uh, change in susceptibility to botrytis, um, but we're now testing whether these interactions are, are true. Another module that TCAP identified um, contained ORA59, ERF1, and five known ORA59 targets. So in this case, interestingly, um, the resolution of our time series was obviously clearly not enough to pick up a difference between the regulator and its targets. So in this case, even though we've only got two hour time points, uh, two hour separation, or 59 and its targets showed clearly correlated e expression. But what this module did do was then predict um, additional targets, both re ones repressed and activated, uh, of those two transcription factors. Okay, so the other way we sort of, we, another way we've um, selected genes modules to, to model, or genes to model together, is using the, the APPLES tool, which is looking at uh, overrepresentation of transcription factor binding motifs. So if we go back to this um, diagram I showed you earlier, this shows you clusters with the um, particular motifs overrepresented. So for example, if we take this cluster here, it's overrepresented for the, for the W box. So what we modeled was, the question is, are well, these genes are, are likely to be co-regulated, but what's regulating them? So we took the genes from this cluster with a W box, those are the blue ones in the model, and we modelled them with all the worky transcription factors, which bind to W boxes, which were differentially expressed during botrytis infection. And what the model predicted was that a single worky was predicted to control the expression of many of these, these blue genes. So again, we've got a hypothesis to go and test. We're getting knockouts of this gene to ask, is it um, regulating all these targets? And another cluster, um, which is enriched for a NAC um, transcription factor motif, we did a similar approach, modelled the, the blue genes, the genes from the cluster with the NAC motif, and the yellow genes are differentially expressed NAC transcription factors. And again, it predicted a single NAC transcription factor. And in this case, um, we know that the, the knockout of this transcription factor has altered susceptibility to, to botrytis. So these are two sort of approaches to, to mod finding groups of genes to model together, um, but we also developed a more sort of comprehensive approach, um, which is the Metropolis Hastings wrapper for our VBSSM modelling. So what this does is um, basically looks for the most likely networks from a, from a subset of genes. So first of all, we reduced our gene list by just focusing on transcription factors. So there's about 630 transcription factors differentially expressed in detritus. So what we do is we take one of them, we just rank, line them up from 1 to 630, and we model that with 80 random genes. 
you get a, a particular marginal likelihood or likelihood of that model. We then change some of those genes, so keep some the same and add some new ones in, model again, and see whether the, the marginal likelihood has improved. If it has, we stay with that model and change a few more genes, uh, model again, and so on. And we do, we've run this 2,000 times um, as the marginal likelihood is increasing towards a sort of optimal model containing this seed gene. After 2,000 iterations, we then go to the next gene in our differentially expressed gene list, maybe X over here, and, and repeat the process. So what we end up with is this is a plot of the marginal likelihoods of the models run around the 630 transcription factors. So there's 630 lines here, and so every line represents uh, 2,000 iterations of models around one transcription factor. So at the end, we've got hundreds of models which contain the strongest and most likely um, predicted interactions between those genes. And what we've, how we've selected target genes for, so our, for future work is by identifying genes which occur frequently in these models, and particularly those which are strong hubs. So they have a lot of down, predicted downstream connections. So, that, so then we get a, a list of, sort of ranked list of hub genes for each of our data sets. Four genes that we've, test, that we've tested um, are highly ranked hubs in both botrytis and the senescence modelling. And out of these, two show a phenotype in both stresses. So here you can just see that this gene is more resistant to botrytis and has a delayed senescence phenotype. So we seem to be picking up um, core regulators. What we can also do from these network, from the um, models that we've got, is combine all the interactions for those hundreds of models to come up with a consensus network. So you get something like this for botrytis, this for, sene for senescence, and this is the overlap between botrytis and senescence. So these are sort of ones you've got more confidence in because they're predicted from two different data sets, um, and we are now validating these. We've got to hurry up a bit. Okay, so one way we're validating them is by doing microarrays or expression profiling of knockouts. But the other way we're validating them is by giving us very good data is by use of a matrix East one hybrid system. So we're basically using a transcription factor library, which enables us to use much longer fragments of the promoters and identify transcription factors binding to those promoters. So for example, here's one target gene that we've used, and we find a number of transcription factors binding to a fragment. And if you plot, again, the time series data comes in extremely usefully. If you plot the expression profile of the target gene with the predicted interactors, you can then find cases such as this, where the interactors show a very <coughs> correlated expression profile and even um, decreasing before that of the target gene. We've also identified um, potential stress-specific regulation with this method. So again, we've got another target gene here with its expression profile in senescence and botrytis. And of the four identified interactors, two seem to be correlated with the expression profile in senescence, and two, the other two seem to be very correlated with the expression profile in botrytis. So you can imagine, perhaps, that the red and green ones are controlling its expression in senescence, whereas the blue and purple are controlling the expression of its target gene in botrytis. So what we're coming up with from our consensus modeling is that we're finding a core regulatory network with so common components across multiple stresses. 
um, and switch points. So we have things where um, we have genes which are common to both senes say, senescence and botrytis with different targets in senescence and different targets in botrytis. Um, genes where we've got common targets in both senescence and botrytis, so common interactions, and cases where we've got a common hub gene, but its regulation appears to be different in senescence and botrytis. So to summarize, what uh, our network modeling is basically the real power of this seems to be in identifying key genes in a process. So I've shown you that we can identify key genes in botrytis infection um, with many of the overexpressed or knockout lines we've tested showing altered susceptibility. We're also identifying core stress response genes um, and common interactions and switches between the different stress response networks. And this is really where we want to focus now. How do these switches work and what, what's the combinatorial um, regulation of transcription factors that's going on? And we're expanding and sort of validating these networks, uh, particularly with our yeast one hybrid matrix. Very nice talk. Uh, Julie Scholes, many years ago, has infected leaves locally with pathogens and then imaged the induction of photosynthesis, and she sees both temporal changes but also spatial changes, uh, which indicate that there's probably areas of the leaf which help the site which is, uh, which is being infected, and this is changing over time between the two positions. So I would imagine that probably half of your uh, interactions which you see here might actually be at least spatially uh, different. Have you ever considered to, to look at the regions using the same approach between infected and non-infected regions? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I've done some very sort of basic array experiments where we've taken, say, 0 to 6 millimeters from the lesion and then 6 to 12 millimeters from the lesion. So on that crude level, I can see genes which are, are specifically expressed in each of those regions. But I haven't done that over time. I mean, I think what, would, what we'd really want to do with this is, because these network models are, um, that they've got a whole lot of the leaf, all different leaf cell types, as well as sort of different stages of infection all together. What we'd like to do is to sort of use, use a sort of stage-specific marker um, in a cell sorting approach to then be able to pull out cells from a specific stage of infection. So maybe ones that are far away that haven't sensed the pathogen, some that have sensed the pathogen, some that are on the verge of being... <laughs> taken over. Um, and that would help to sort of pull apart those networks. But at the moment, I have got sort of crude data um, on that.